Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. Today we're dealing with the final episode of the final Spanish period, which ran from 1781 until 1821 when we became part of the United States. In our last episode, we talked of the uh, move of uh, General Andrew Jackson at the order of President Monroe into Spanish territory here in Florida to put down an activity at what we would today call Apalachicola, where a, a group of brigands had set up a, a, a trade where they stole slaves out of Alabama, resold them on the New Orleans market, and so we're creating quite a, a lot of economic turmoil for the, from the, uh, for the planters. At this point, uh, when the Spanish refused to take action against these men, against these brigands, uh, Governor, uh, excuse me, uh, President Monroe uh, ordered Andrew Jackson, who was still the, uh, the gen uh, adjutant general of the troops in uh, Tennessee, to bring his uh, militia down south and put down this, uh, this activity. And, Jan and, and Andrew Jackson did just exactly that. He, he marched with about a thousand men, uh, subdued, uh, took, uh, captured the fort, and of course, uh, at that point in time, he uh, at first thought this, his mission was over. But at that time, a, a man by the name of William King has quite an influence on our story. King was a, a uh, a very active member of the uh, Andrew Jackson group. And King said to him, now, Andrew, uh, this, all of this could not have uh, occurred. All this, this uh, mischief could not have occurred if the, if the Seminoles had not been a part of it. While we're here, we might as well march a few miles to the east and take care of them. Let's give them a little spanking while we're here. And Jackson, who, who never did have a, a great relationship with Indians, agreed. And so they began their march southeast into the, uh, into the uh, eastern part of the Panhandle. And as they moved, quite by accident, they just stumbled onto a camp there that was maintained by two British agents named Arbuth Arbister and Ambrister, Arbuthnot and Ambrister, I always mess up those two names, Arbuthnot and Ambrister, and these men with a number of, uh, of other uh, scouts with them were there apparently, at least in Jackson's eyes, to, to stir up mischief as the British had been doing ever since the end of the Revolutionary War. Well, Jackson, he was not a man to, to weigh words. He brought these men, accused them uh, uh, before a court, accused them of being spies. Uh, they, had been, they had been seized about three o'clock in the afternoon. The court convened about four. They were convicted at 4.30, and the two principals were hung that afternoon. Of course, the rest of them were, less of the men were allowed to, re to retreat into their own, uh, into their own uh, resources. Jackson then went on. They, they did meet with the Spen uh, Seminoles. There was a little spanking took place. And now he was ready to march back to, uh, to uh, Tennessee, when again, William King intervened and said, now, Andrew, None of this could have occurred if the Spanish in Pensacola had not been turning a blind eye to it and giving permission to those, those, those brigands, those pirates, to do what they did. And Andrew said, well, you're probably right. So they marched clear back across the territory, got to Pensacola, and of course the Spanish were alerted to what was happening, and the governor, Governor Jose Mazat, sent his small militia out to oppose him. All, all Mazat was doing, of course, was, was uh, upholding his honor because there wasn't much of a battle. A half a dozen shots were fired. And now Andrew Jackson, with an American force operating in Spanish sovereign territory, has captured Pensacola. He moves together, and what he does now is rather unique. They round up all of the, of the civil servants, all of the governor, gubernatorial uh, manpower, and all of the militia. And by chance, there is a Spanish vessel sitting at the dock. They load all of these men on a, this Spanish vessel and send them back to Cuba. And then Jackson leaves William King, Colonel King, in charge of Pensacola. Well, of course, he gets back, finally files his report to Washington. In the meanwhile, of course, there are protests flooding into Washington from the British, from the Spanish. Every, there's just a great hubbub. And now uh, Andrew Jackson's case is brought before the total cabinet. And uh, as they convene and talk about what he had done, uh, one of the men who has never gotten along with Jackson and who in the, in the future would be his enemy, a man named John C. Calhoun from uh, South Carolina, says, well, what we ought to do is court-martial the man and strip him of all honors and all pay, and uh, he's, he's done us a terrible disservice. And then uh, the uh, Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, said, now, wait a minute. Look what he's done. Now, what, he has moved in there, and he has taken possession of Florida. Also, he has helped us overcome this problem with the brigands. Now, why don't we do this? 
He said, we're at a point now where sooner or later, the United States is going to own Florida. We've got all the pieces in, in position now. Why don't we do this? We'll offer the Spanish government to pay the claims of the, of the Alabama planters that are above the $5 million, which are an obligation, we think, of the Spanish. Then we will offer to take, that will be their payment, the Spanish payment to us for Florida. Well, the cabinet looked at Mr. Jack, uh, Mr. Adams and said, well, it's brilliant. Why don't we do that? And uh, of course, as they sat around and went a little bit further, they, they suggested, well, why don't we ask for Texas too? But they didn't, they didn't do that at that point in time. In any event, the, uh, the message uh, went, was, they called in the Spanish ambassador, whose name was Jose Onis, and Mr. Adams and Mr. Onis sat there and they put together what became known uh, historically as the Adams-Onis Treaty. And basically what it said was, in exchange for the $5 million, which the United States government would use to pay those uh, the planters for their losses, Spain would deed all of Florida from the Keys to the uh, out to the uh, to Mobile. They would cede it to the United States. Well, the Spanish, of course, were furious. The king, uh, the uh, king, the King Ferdinand, and the and the council, they were just absolutely furious at what was being done. But they realized they were realists. They realized that they had no hope in the world. If the United States decided they it wanted Florida, they could take it, which is basically what they had done. So the treaty was signed, and the arrangement was made that the exchange of flags would take place sometime in the summer of the year 1821, about two and a half years from the point of the signing of the treaty. Now, as this word got out, of course, the word came out along that this is going to become the United States, you can imagine the sort of things that began to happen. People uh, in, the, in Alabama and Georgia and other places said, Florida is going to be an absolute boom area. We've got to move in there. We've got to get land. We're going to make, we're going to make our fortunes in, in land and other transactions. All we have to do is, is be on the right side at the right moment. And so all sorts of transactions began. And of course, there were some of the, uh, some of the, of the people who were resident here who were Spanish or French felt that, well, maybe we don't want to stay and be American. So they were, some of them, not many, but some of them were, were willing to sell out. So these traction, transactions went back and forth, back and forth. And finally, the United States Congress, being very, very wise in this matter, decided, okay, we, we're not going to allow this to be a, a, an issue, a social issue. So they set an exact date, the date on which the treaty itself was signed, as the date on which no, beyond which no further transactions would be recognized. So everything had to be before the treaty signing date in the, in the middle of the year 1819. So now all of the arrangements are made. They, the changeover is going to take place. The next question is, who are we going to send, who is the United States going to send to Florida to take over, to, be, to accept the change of flags and set up a new government? Well, uh, as, as all that discussion was going on, of course, the Congress began looking at what they should do, how, what kind of a situation they should set up in Florida. How would they operate? Because this was, this was a little, this was quite different with, than it happened in 1803 in Louisiana, uh, but because there, was, there were no Americans there. Uh, so uh, the, the discussions went back and forth, and finally the decision was made, well, let's ask Andrew Jackson, Jackson to go. He's been there. Jackson would probably uh, be a good, do a good job. Uh, some of the cabinet didn't want to do that, but they finally decided to. And now what I'm going to tell you next is, of course, it's part story, part legend. It may be true, it may not. I don't know. But anyway, basically, picture this. We're in the year, we've moved into the year now, in the latter part of the year, 17, uh, 1820, and Jackson is home at his home in Tennessee at the Hermitage, and one afternoon he's sitting there reading the paper and, and smoking a pipe, and Rachel has gone to the, to the market, and the messenger comes up with this story, with this invitation to become the first governor of Florida. And Jackson looks it over and he said, oh, no, I've been to Florida. I don't, I know, I'm, I'm busy with other things. I don't want to go. So he scribbles out a message, sends it down to the post office and sits back and continues his reading. An hour or two later, Rachel comes home and, he, and Andrew tells his wife what he has done. And Rachel said, now, Andrew, I don't think that was too wise. Now, just think of it this way. Over the last two or three years, you have your friends your volunteers have gone with you several times into Florida. They've never been paid. Some of them lost their lives. Some of them got sick and, or, or, or injured. They, they didn't, weren't able to mine their farms. Now, if you, if you take this job as governor, there are going to be some very nice jobs there in Florida, and you could make a, uh, some sort of compensation to your friends. 
Andrew said, my dear, you're right, absolutely right. So he quickly wrote another note and sent that along with the messenger back down to the post office. And how he got the original one back, I suppose things were a little less formal in those days. But anyway, he did. And so Andrew Jackson now has accepted the, the role of governor of Florida. We come to the year now, 1821. We're into the spring, and now Governor Mazat has left. Of course, he, I don't, I'm not sure whether he ever actually came back after being sent back to Cuba. But anyway, we have a new governor at, Pens at Pensacola of, of all of uh, Florida, and his name is, is Jose Cayava. And Mr. Cayava uh, is a very, very honorable man. He, he hates, the, the, he's never seen Jackson, but he just hates the very idea of him because what Jackson has done to, to Spanish Florida. Anyway, Jackson accepts the role, and they start, he and his, his wife and several companies of, of infantry, along with a band, now move south, and they move down the river and across, and they, uh, to, uh, to follow the protocol, Jackson knows that he wants to, to, wants to set up a camp outside of Pensacola so that the initial stage of negotiation will be done properly, because the way it was set up to handle. Uh, Jackson was supposed to make camp, and the, uh, the Spanish outgoing governor was to make a protocol visit to him, after which Jackson would go back and make a similar visit into Pensacola with the Spanish governor, and then the two would set up the arrangements for the exchange of flags. Jackson moved in, and he said, I, I think I know just where we'll stay. My friend Manuel Gonzalez, whom I met there when we marched in back in 1814, he's got a fine spread out there. I bet Manuel would recognize, would, would be happy to have us. And so they sent a messenger ahead, and Manuel Gonzalez said, absolutely, you come in. And Jackson's force moved in, and they set up their cantonment for the settlement of the soldiers there about 12 to 13 miles north of Pensacola. And that's where they were. Well, <clears throat> things went on. They set up the camp in very orderly fashion, and word was sent in to Mr. Cayava that Jackson is here is expecting your visit. Cayava wouldn't come. He was, going, he was not going to kowtow to this, this rough, rude American at all. And well, a week went by, two weeks. And finally, Rachel looked at her husband and said, now look, Andrew, you can continue to play these games all you want to. I'm going in and get an air-conditioned room at the Pensacola Hilton. Uh, I, I can't stand the flies, uh, mosquitoes, and gnats, and the we hot weather out here. And so she did. And while she was there, Rachel observed how the Spanish in Pensacola were observing the Sabbath. And Rachel, of course, was a very religious woman, and she did not like what she saw. Well, finally, Cayava broke down. He made his visit. Jackson went back into Pensacola and made his visit. And the arrangement was set so that the, uh, the actual exchange of flags was going to take place on the 17th of July in this year, 1821. And so on that given day, the American force had been marched into Pensacola, and approximately 10 minutes or so before 10, uh, the Americans marched into what we today call Plaza Ferdinand, and they lined up on one side of the flagstaff. A few minutes later in came a company of the Spanish soldiers, and they, op they lined up opposite. And then uh, promptly at 10 o'clock, Governor Cayava moved from one side of the square, John Jackson from the other, and they stood opposite. And uh, on a given signal, a Spanish sergeant stepped forward and drew down the Spanish flag. And as he did so, the, all the, the whole population of Pensacola was there. All 700 of them were there. And you could see the, and listen to the, to the cries of, the, of distress of the Spanish, Spanish women because they were, they were so upset, they didn't know what was happening. Finally, then once the Spanish flag was down, an American star, a sergeant stepped forward and raised the Star Spangled banner. Now there is a story, where's the, where's the American flag? There is a story, and I don't know whether it's true, that the, the little band that was with Andrew Jackson's force played the Star Spangled Banner at that time. Uh, it may be true, there are two written accounts that say so, but that the, the song had only been written a few years before, and technically it wasn't accepted as our national anthem until much, much later. But nonetheless, we'll assume that they played it. And so at that point in time, the Spanish flag has come down, the American flag has gone on, gone up, and now we are ready for Andrew Jackson as the new governor to tell the, new, the citizens there what's going to happen to them as American citizens. And that's where our story will resume next time.